The Montgomery County Office of Consumer Protection is responsible for enforcing consumer protection laws here in the county. We'll be right on it. Thank you. Most consumer complaints involve automobile repairs, towing disputes, defective merchandise, and home improvement problems. But we also handle lottery scams, fake checks, and ID theft. In fact, these are federal crimes since they often involve mail fraud. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service investigates these types of crimes and has provided a few videos to help us understand how to avoid being scammed. My partner and I are postal inspectors, which means we investigate any crime that involves the mail. Today that means doing a stakeout on a low-life accountant. He works for an investment firm that's really just a front for a complicated fraud scam. They've been ripping people off to the tune of thousands of dollars. He's got no clue what that kind of financial loss means to his victims. He never gets to see that side of the story, but I do. Do you have any luck flipping this guy? No, he dummied up on me. Said they kept him in the dark about how business operated. Certainly living the high life for a CPA. Not anymore. Goddard. Inspector Goddard. This is Andrea Bashirs with News 12. Did I catch you at a bad time? Actually, Andrea, I got nothing but time. What's up? Well, we're doing a special on fraud for sweeps, and we need some first-person perspective on the crimes. You know, talk to victims and hear their stories. Do you think you could help us out? Yeah, sounds good to me. We could stop a lot of this stuff if more people were aware of it. Hey, you know Carla Horan, our victim witness coordinator? She might have some leads for us. Let me run this past her and I'll get back to you later this week. Financial crime attacks its victims at their core. Whenever someone loses control of their money or their identity, they often also lose their critical sense of security. They doubt their own judgment, and many suffer depressive episodes after the crime. My job is to help people rebuild not only their financial security, but their lives. Mr. and Ms. Patterson? Hi. Thanks so much for coming in. Listen, please don't be nervous. If you stumble <laughs> or you're not happy with what you say, we can always shoot it again, okay? Okay. You ready to get started? Sure thing. Have a seat. It's kind of my studio open this up in five, four, three, two, one. We're out. Tonight on News 12, we continue our special series on mail fraud, Return to Sender. Three years ago, Matt and Lisa Patterson were the victims of identity theft. Along with hundreds of other victims in the area, they had their lives turned upside down by two young criminals. Lisa, how did you find out that there was a problem? We were trying to buy a new house, and um, our real estate agent called and said our loan would not be approved. 
that we had outstanding bills on our um, credit cards, and we even had a, a, a loan that we had defaulted on. Matt, do you remember how you felt that morning? Oh, it was awful. Uh, yeah, your first response is that it's, um, it's, it's a mistake, it's, it's just an error, but uh, and it sinks in and, and you feel um, angry, powerless. We didn't get the house. But we, we were actually lucky. The postal inspectors had a specialist to work with the victims and she explained what steps we needed to take to repair our credit report. Uh, she, she helped us with letters and affidavits and, and really walked us through the whole process. Um, she, she called my boss to explain why I'd have to miss work uh, to appear at the trial. Uh, she, she even helped us with the, the victim impact statement for the, for the judge to read before sentencing us to. I think you can handle things for a while. Sure. What's up? Uh, I think I know someone who needs to hear these stories. I do not want to wait for him to catch the news. It won't be long, okay? Who is it? It's Postal Inspector Alan Goddard. Open up, Harrison. Hello, Inspector. What can I do for you? Well, you could ask me in, for starters. Thought we'd have a little chat. I told you I don't know anything about this case. I don't know what good it can do to keep talking to me about it. Can I come in, or do I need to get a warrant? Hold on. Pardon the mess. She asked you to leave, didn't she? Well, what'd you expect after she found out what kind of man you really are? It didn't have anything to do with these allegations against the company. Right. Uh, okay, if I sit. Can I uh, offer you a shot, Inspector? I guess not. I'm duty and all. You didn't come here to talk to me about my marriage, did you? I came here to ask you a question, Mark. Do you believe in fairy tales? What kind of talk is that? Fairy tales? Yeah, you know. Little Red Riding Hood, Humpty Dumpty. The fairy tales. Do you believe in them? No, of course not. Me either. That's why I'm not believing any of this crap about you not knowing anything about the scams that your company is pulling. You see what I'm saying? Buy what you want, believe what you want. I told you already. I mean, what, what do we want to do? I want you to take a ride with me. Are you arresting me? No, you're not under arrest. There are some people I want you to meet. I just want you to listen to what they have to say. Can you do that for me? I lost nearly $30,000 in that investment fraud. The worst part about it was that I thought that I had it. It was a good investment. I really thought it was good. And I encouraged my family and friends to invest also. And because my background is in banking, my friends, they listened to me. When I found out, though, that, that I had been conned, I felt personally responsible for the money that they had lost. You know, I felt like I, I lost my credibility. Can you imagine having to go home to your wife and tell her that you've lost a large chunk of your savings? Or calling my best friend to let him know that, you know, hey, the stocks that I, I told you were good were actually a scam? You know, I felt responsible for that, you know, and, and it made me look like a fool. Mandy Richards served a six-month sentence in Alderson Federal Prison for Women for her part in helping provide lists of potential victims that were used in an identity theft scam by her boyfriend. She joins us by satellite now. Mandy, I know you have been through a lot over the past year. How did your boyfriend get you involved in all of this? Well, he fooled me. He told me that he really needed some help to meet a quota at work. And he said, you know, how about giving me some of those applications? that people turn in, the people that you guys don't hire. What so, was he doing with those applications? He was stealing people's identity. Now, I didn't know that. He told me he was trying to do a good job at work. 
So naturally I wanted to help him out, but it's not what he was doing. How did you find out what he was using the applications for? <laughs> well, when they came to my job and interrogated me, and then eventually I was arrested, and they took my little girl away. Well, that's one person who has suffered a lot is your daughter. Yes, yeah, Tell has. us about that. Well, I mean, like I said, they put her in foster care. I went to jail. They supervised my visits with her. You have kids, don't you? She would cry when I would leave. Yeah. Two girls. I didn't think I would ever get her back, but I found out. People never think about the kids that get left behind when their parents go to jail. I know that your boyfriend has threatened to kill you in the past. Mm -hmm. What happens when he gets out of jail? Well, I don't know, but there's a way I can find out when he gets out. It's a website, and it's called VNS, and everybody should know about it. It's a victim notification system, and it lets me know when he gets out of prison, so I don't have to be afraid all the time. Ms. Horan, you're up next, so we need to get you into makeup. Great, thanks. Think your girls would be proud of what you're doing? I lost everything. Um, my wife wouldn't forgive me for, uh, well, I had borrowed money from our son's college fund. I wanted to send him to a better school. I thought I could double my money, but, but I can barely afford the community college tuition that he goes to now. And a few months after the trial, my wife left me. Th th these crooks got eight years for mail fraud, uh, and the cells they live in, they're, they're bigger than my apartment. My, my ex-wife has to take a second job. So do I. It, it, it seems like my family went to prison, too. Except they didn't do anything wrong. I did. That reaction isn't uncommon. People often blame themselves for things that happen to them, even though they're really no fault of their own. Oftentimes, they are so embarrassed that they won't even tell their own family. We see all kinds of very intelligent, educated people who fall into these scams. Well, is Mr. Matson's story unusual? I wish that it were. I've seen victims lose their homes, suffer job losses, have problems in relationships, even divorce. Ready to? Take well, two. Well, the good news is, is that you're there to help them rebuild their lives. We're out. Faith plan. All right, let's get out of here. Inspector, I'd like to talk to you about the company now. I think maybe I can help put some of the pieces in place. All right. You want to bring your lawyer in? That would be best, wouldn't it? Do you think maybe the U.S. attorney would make me a deal? Well, I can't speak for him, Mark, but uh, I'm sure I'll take your cooperation into consideration. Were any of those people we were watching today ones that lost from our company? No, no, no. Those are, those are all from older cases. I always thought the banks or the credit card companies would cover their losses. I never... Well, it's, it's just like the fairy tale. All the king's horses and all the king's men just couldn't put things back together again. Well, let's go take that statement. Need that paperwork by Tuesday. You got it, boss. All right, thanks. Mark Harrison's remorse about his crime proved to be short-lived. After agreeing to testify against the leaders of the fraud ring, he was arrested again less than a year later for helping to operate an internet auction scam. These types of criminals rarely have any regard for their victims or the damage that they've done to their lives. If you or someone you know has been a crime victim, it's important that you know about victims' rights and the services available to you. In 2004, the Justice for All Act was passed, strengthening rights for federal crime victims. Most states have similar protections for cases handled in the local criminal justice system. All of these victims' bills of rights were created to give victims a proper place in the criminal justice system. They provide an opportunity to participate and be heard, and offer practical assistance to minimize the inconveniences and frustrations that crime victims suffer. You can find out more about your rights as a federal crime victim by visiting this website, www.crimevictims.gov. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service investigates many different types of financial crimes. Most are handled in the federal justice system.
In addition to providing educational material about crime victims' rights and services, the Inspection Service continually strives to inform the public about current fraud scams and how to avoid becoming a victim. Education is your best defense. Keep up to date on the latest scams by visiting our websites, www.usps.com slash postal inspectors and www.lookstogoodtobetrue.com. Remember, being the victim of a crime is nothing to be ashamed of. Neither is seeking help to recover from it. I didn't want to come here, but I couldn't ask Mrs. Washburn to drive all the way back into town just to hear more bad news. Her daughters suggested meeting them halfway, and this place was it. The stock they sold you is basically worthless. Either the companies don't exist, or they've never heard of Lowe and Michael's investments. Oh, I should have known better. I started getting these investment offers in the mail shortly after my husband died. Yes, I should have done my due diligence before sending them any money at all. These crooks are very slick, Mrs. Washburn. And they target seniors with mailing lists, lottery sweepstakes. Once they get your information, they don't give up. Have you arrested these criminals yet? I mean, even if you can't recover any of my money, I would like the satisfaction of knowing that they're going to pay for their actions. It's a bit more complicated than that. Lowe and Michaels is what we call a boiler room. It's basically a bank of phones and con men. They've set up shop in Canada to make it harder to prosecute. It would be very helpful if we could get access to your phone records. Sure, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, however, I have caller ID on all the phones at home, and I don't remember ever seeing a call that came from outside the country. Usually the calls are routed through switchers here in the US. Or they use prepaid cell phones or calling cards. They do the same with the mail, so you never see foreign postmarks. I see how clever of them. My husband always handled all of our investments. Perhaps I should have hired somebody after. The investments were so small, especially in the beginning, and I, I guess I wanted to think that I could do it on my own. It's difficult watching someone when they realize that they've been taken. I could imagine Doris Washburn sitting alone in her house, just starting to realize that her husband was really gone. Then the phone rings, and it's a nice young man asking if she'd had a chance to read the prospectus that she'd received in the mail. She probably explained that she hadn't had time since her husband had only recently passed away. The con man would have then stopped talking about investments altogether. He'd spin some story about losing his aunt or sister. They might have talked for an hour or more without him ever once asking for money. 
By the time they'd hung up, Doris Washburn might have thought she'd made a new friend. The next time he called, she'd be happy to make a small investment. Is there anything else you can recall that might help us? Did you speak to anyone else besides Matthew Raines? Yes, I spoke to his supervisor on at least two occasions. And if anything, he was even more charming than Mr. Raines. I remember he always asked how my daughter was holding up. Mom, I'll get the car. Oh, all right, honey. I believe his first name was um, Richards or Richardson, something like that. I know I have it written down at home. I'm, I'm very careful about taking good notes. I believe his first name was Park. Park Richards? Park Richards. Park Richardson. Park Richardson. <laughs> I'll need to get your notes today, Doris. All right. We're going to get to the bottom of this, I promise. It couldn't be. We busted a boiler room operator named Park Richardson just before my father died three years ago. This was exactly the type of scam he used to run. Can I tell you about that one, George? Can I tell you all about up on that one, George? Didn't I tell you I have my own mother in that stock, George? Got her. Hey, Alan. Hey, what's up? Can you run a check with Marshalls and see if Park Richardson is still locked up? Richardson? Isn't that the guy that was running that investment scam? The, uh when your father's friend was mixed up in? Yeah, that's him. I'm working a U.S.-Canadian cross-border case. Uh-huh. Sounds like his M.O. If it is him, it might make extradition easier. Gotcha. I know the U.S. attorney would love to get him back. So would I. Yeah, let me check with the marshals. Great. Give me about 20 minutes, okay? Thanks. Great. It didn't take long to find out Park Richardson was released from prison four months ago. While he was inside the joint, he must have picked up some new tricks. We've gotten good at finding and busting boiler rooms in the U.S., so their newest wrinkle is taking their operations across the border, sometimes to Canada, Latin America, or an offshore island. But as fast as they can change their tactics, so can we. The Phone Busters National Call Center is a Canadian telemarketing fraud complaint organization. We now routinely work with Canada on cross-border fraud schemes. I called one of my contacts there and gave him all I had on Lowen Michaels and my suspicions about Park Richardson. Right, I got it. Two days later, an email brings me a passport photo of a man named Park Richards, who's in Canada on a tourist visa. Check yeah. The photo awesome. confirms it's our guy. Knowing the city he's in helps, and within a few days, Canadian law enforcement has tracked down the location of the boiler room in Montreal. Hello. Takes time for the Canadians to build their case get the warrants, make the arrest. But I don't mind waiting. The look on Park Richardson's face is gonna make it all worthwhile. You can't keep me here. I'm an American citizen. I demand to speak to someone with the U.S. Embassy, like pronto. This is just, this is all just a big mistake. A misunderstanding of the French-English thing you guys have. Park Richardson, remember me? At your trial, I told you she'd try a new line of work. This one has too many occupational hazards. Listen, no matter what they think I've done here, it happened in Canada. So it's none of your business. Except your victims are in the US, and you use the US mail to get to them. That makes it my business. Look, this is all just a big mistake. I just came to help a friend of mine start up a small company. None of this is even in my name. We're extraditing you to the U.S. to face mail fraud charges. Well, plenty of time to sort it all out. About 10 years. Let's go for it. Yeah, see you in court. Thanks to our partnerships with Canada, Park Richardson is now serving a 10-year sentence for mail fraud. Effective law enforcement within the U.S. has driven these criminals across borders in an effort to hide their crimes. While U.S.-Canadian cross-border task forces are helping to stop these crimes, prevention is still the best medicine. Consumers should be aware that there's an increasing trend for fraud schemes to operate outside the U.S. Modern travel, communications, and the internet make it even easier for these crooks to prey on you. You can help protect yourself with some simple steps. 
one. If an offer seems too good to be true, it probably is. Beware of anything that promises large sums of money, sweepstakes, or lottery winnings in exchange for your advance payment, donation, or investment. Two, don't allow yourself to be pressured into making a decision. Consult with your financial advisor, Better Business Bureau, family member, or trusted friend, or your Consumer Protection Bureau before deciding to act. Three, remember that legitimate businesses will never object to you asking questions. They're also happy to provide references. Beware of anyone who tries to conceal their mailing address, telephone number, or evades questions about their operations. Four, be aware that if you respond to even one of these offers, your name will likely be added to a mooch list by these criminals. These are mailing lists similar to those used by legitimate businesses that track people who've fallen for these scams in the past. They're bought and sold as part of these underground enterprises. Five, be cautious if a company insists on using a commercial wire transfer service to send money. It's often impossible to verify the actual destination where the money will be picked up making the receiver of the money difficult to trace. Always pay by credit card or postal money order. And if you think you've been the victim of fraud, you need to report it. These reports are vital in helping to track down these criminal operations, especially if they're operating outside the United States. You can contact your local postal inspector in the phone book or on our website at usps.com slash postal inspectors. Cross-border fraud can be a world of trouble for its victims. Make sure that you're not one of them. The United States Postal Inspection Service would like to recognize our partners in law enforcement for their efforts in combating cross-border frauds. These include Project Colt in Montreal, the Toronto Strategic Partnership, Project mTOR in Vancouver, the Alberta Partnership Against Cross-Border Fraud in Calgary. The Vancouver Strategic Alliance. And the Atlantic Partnership in Halifax. These task forces target criminals in Canada who operate fraudulent foreign lotteries, price promotions, sweepstakes, advance payment loans, credit card and internet scams. The Phone Busters National Call Center assists these partnerships in investigating and prosecuting criminals who commit cross-border and telemarketing fraud. Our ability to protect U.S. consumers is greatly enhanced by these partnerships, and we are grateful for their cooperation. today's economy i check my credit annually you can do it too for free under the law it's guaranteed annualcreditreport.com the one you can depend upon other sites may turn your head they say they're free don't be misled once you're in their tangled web they'll sell you something else instead annualcreditreport.com the one you can depend upon all the others charge a fee read the fine print and you'll see that's the harsh reality i should know because it happened to me mm -hmm. For truly free credit reports, there's only one authorized source. Annualcreditreport.com, the one you can depend upon. Annualcreditreport.com, no hidden fees, absolutely free. I understand you need a little help with your mortgage. Want to avoid foreclosure. Candy? Um, well, you know, you're in luck. We're uh, experts in this sort of thing. Mortgage, rigmarole, whatnot. 
Why don't we get a contract? Who wants a contract? Uh, I don't... Here you go, Pete. Thanks, Betty. Right a toner. If you're facing foreclosure, talk to the right people. Speak with HUD-approved housing counselors free of charge at 888-995-HOPE.